Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You are the children of God. You are the children of God because of the love the Father has lavished on you in Jesus Christ. A father does not lavish his love on those who are not his children. A father lavishes his love on those who are his children. And since the Father has lavished his love on you in Jesus Christ, you are the children of God. God has said that you are his children. And when God says things, they happen. If God says, let the land produce vegetation, the land produces vegetation. If he says, let the greater light govern the day and the lesser light govern the night, the greater light governs the day and the lesser light, it governs the night. If God says, let there be light, there is light. If he says, you are the children of God, you are the children of God. And God has promised you, his children, a glorious future. He has promised that when his son, Jesus Christ, returns on the last day, the living and the dead will be judged by him. And in order for Jesus to judge the living and the dead, he must raise the dead. And so God promises you a glorious future. He promises to raise you from the dead. He promises to raise you from the dead so that you will stand in front of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the judgment of the living and the dead. In order for Jesus to judge the living and the dead, they must stand before him. In order for the dead to stand before him, he must raise the dead. And so Jesus promises you resurrection from the dead. He promises you a glorious future. When you die, your soul goes to be with Jesus and your body is laid in the ground. When Jesus raises you from the dead, your body is restored, alive, and your respective soul is returned to it, and you live again. That is the resurrection of the dead. That is the glorious future that God has promised you. You are His children. Now, when I talk about the resurrection of the dead, it generates certain questions. And I'd like to just answer a few of these questions that I get when I talk about the resurrection of the dead. One of the questions I get is this. Pastor, will God be able to raise cremated people from the dead? This question always takes me by surprise. And I don't think that I have ever really given a very good answer to the people who have asked me this question because the question takes me by surprise. And the reason that the question takes me by surprise is because you are asking me whether or not God is able to do something. He is God, after all, right? We confess that He is the Almighty. If God is the Almighty, He can do anything. He can raise the dead, yes, even if they've been cremated. Well, Pastor, what if they've been cremated their ashes and scattered everywhere? Okay. Yes, he'll be able to raise that dead person too. What about people who have been incinerated in a fire? Yes, they'll be able to raise those people too. What about the people who died at sea when their boat sank and their body was never recovered to the bottom of the ocean? Yes. God will be able to raise that person too. In fact, the scriptures address themselves to this topic because when the book of Revelation describes the resurrection of the dead, it says specifically that the sea will give up the dead that is in it. And then this question I love. For you nitpicky scientists out there, Pastor, when I die, if Jesus waits a really long time to come back, my body will decay, my casket will decay, the vault that I'm in will decay, it will all decay. And I will either become food for worms, or I will be processed into the soil, the grass will use me to grow, cows will eat the grass. <laughs> yeah! And then people will eat that cow. And then my molecules will be in the molecules of other people's 
bodies. Now at the resurrection, who's going to get the molecules? Okay, folks, let us say, I don't know. But not only is God the Almighty, God is the all-knowing. He would not promise you resurrection of your bodies unless he knew how to do it. So, God is almighty. God is all-powerful. You are his children. He has promised you resurrection from the dead. He will do it. As long as God is true and no liar, he will do it. He raised his son from the dead. He will raise you from the dead. Now, another question I get. In terms of my physical appearance, how old will I look? Okay, now folks, yeah, look. Yeah, see, this shows our vanity. <laughs> All right? You know, I don't care if in eternity I look older because I will live forever. Okay? The only reason that our appearance bothers us is because that we know as our appearance changes, we're getting closer to that hole in the ground. Let me tell you something about that hole in the ground. A hole in the ground is temporary for the children of God who are coming out of there. Jesus will raise you from the dead. Now, to answer the question, I think a member of our own congregation gave a suitable answer to this question. Since at the resurrection we will be like Jesus, we will see him as he is, if we're going to be like Jesus in other respects, why not be like Jesus in terms of our physical appearance in regards to age? Since he began his ministry at approximately 30 years of age, according to John's Gospel, we think it took approximately three years for our Lord to do his ministry, then he was crucified and raised from the dead at approximately 33 years of age. Okay? So when you rise from the dead, you're 33. Fair enough? <laughs> now, of course, the question behind the question is this. Pastor, what about infants who die? What about babies who die? Does God raise them as babies? No, they'll be 33. <laughs> I mean, what's so bad, folks, with rising from the dead as a 10-year-old for eternity, okay? I mean, that's not bad. And I'm sure that God will have something suitable in mind for the infants and for the stillers. Okay, so those are some of the questions I get when I preach or teach about the resurrection of the body from the dead. Now, now I want to talk about what Jesus wants to talk about when it comes to the resurrection of our bodies from the dead. Number one, you will be sinless. Number two, you will be deathless. And number two, three, you will be sickless. Now, folks, under the forgiveness of your sins, you are sinless already. Let me say that again. Under the forgiveness of your sins, you are sinless already. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is yours by faith. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is sinless. If you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith, then before God, you are sinless already. The problem is, is that we all know how we act on a daily basis. We do not experience our sinlessness. We do not experience our righteousness. We still know about the sins that we go out and constantly commit every day. That's why we keep coming back for the forgiveness of our sins. We don't experience the full manifestation of our righteousness. And we sure don't experience the full manifestation of other people's righteousness. Kind of hard to see our own sin sometimes. Really easy to see the sin of somebody else. So when I say to you that after the resurrection of the dead, you will be sinless, what I mean is this. That after Jesus raises you from the dead, you will fully experience your sinlessness. You will see the full manifestation of your righteousness, and you will see the full manifestation of the righteousness of the other children of God. Think of it, people. Think of it a world. You're looking at Jesus. You see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because you see Him, you fear Him above all things, you love Him above all things,
above all things and you trust in him above all things. A world where nobody hurts anybody. You don't hurt anybody and nobody hurts you. Why, you don't even hurt other people with your words and they don't hurt you with their words. Think of that world. They're not out to get your money and you're not out to get theirs. There's no greed there. There's no covetousness. No selfishness whatsoever. People do not run you down after the resurrection and you do not run other people down after the resurrection. Nobody stabs you in the back and you don't stab anybody else in the back. Nobody gossips about you. You don't gossip about anybody else. No adultery, no lust, no covetousness of any kind. Think of the manifestation of your righteousness. You are the children of God. And after Jesus raises you from the dead, He will make that righteousness <coughs> fully manifest in your life and in the lives of all of God's children. You will be sinless. You will also be deathless. Deathless. You will not die after you rise again from the dead. And according to the promise of the resurrection, you are technically deathless now. But when we look in the mirror, we can see that we are getting ever and ever older, ever and ever closer to our graves, ever and ever nearer to that hole in the ground. And so the fullness of our deathlessness has not been manifested. We still look as if we are dying. After Jesus raises you from the dead, you will experience the full manifestation of your deathlessness. You will experience the full manifestation of your immortality. He will raise your body from the dead and it will simply live. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. There will be nothing on this earth that will harm you. If the sun that governs the day and the moon that governs the night will not harm you, then nothing else under their dominion will harm you either. Which means that after the resurrection, there are no terminal diseases. After the resurrection, there are no accidents in which people perish. There are no sudden deaths. After the resurrection, we will not need undertakers or funeral homes. We will not need grief counseling after the resurrection. For he himself will wipe every tear from their eyes. I have mentioned in the last few Sundays in the sermons that Jesus has an indestructible life. And the reason I keep mentioning that is because it's in the Bible. Jesus has an indestructible life. And after you rise from the dead, you will see him and you will be like him. And if you will be like him, then you will have an indestructible life also. That is your future, children of God. I've emphasized recently in several sermons that death no longer has mastery over Jesus. He cannot die again. And the reason that I emphasize that is because it's true. It's in the Bible. It's in Romans chapter 6. And if after you rise from the dead you see Jesus, you will be like him. And if you will be like him, then death will no longer have mastery over you. You can only die once. You can't die twice. At least the children of God can't die twice. If you want to read about the second death, you may read the book of Revelation. That's your future. When you rise from the dead, you will experience your immortality. You will experience your deathlessness. It will be fully manifest to you. The... Uh, Wednesday morning Bible class made an interesting discovery a couple weeks ago. This is fascinating. In James chapter 5, God inspired James to write these words. If anyone of, among you is sick, let him call for the pastors of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the person who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, pray for one another, confess your sins to one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. Now, did you hear that, people? Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
The only reason you confess your sins to each other is to be forgiven. Therefore, for forgiveness brings healing. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says the sacrament of the altar brings healing. The hallmark of our Lord's ministry was he went about healing. <laughs> healed everybody. Forgave them, healed them, restored them. So, sin causes sicknesses. The only reason we get sick people is because we're sinners. The only reason we go to the doctor, land in the hospital, is because we're sinners. And we need our sins forgiven, and we need healing, and the Lord promises you both. Now, we know that the wages of sin is death. That's been preached to us. But understand that the wages of sin is also the sicknesses, even the ones that are not life-threatening, like a bad back, or cold, bad eyesight, having trouble remembering things, mental diseases of all kinds, everything, all of our sicknesses are a result of our sins. So, here's what that means. When Jesus rises you, rises you, blah, raises you from the dead, you will be sickless. You will never get sick again. You'll never catch the cold, Never catch the flu, no mental disturbances, no cancer, no strokes, no broken bones of any kind. You will rise from the dead and you will live. You will experience the fullness of your sicklessness. This is the future that Jesus has promised you. You are the children of God. When he raises you from the dead, you will see him as he is. And when he raises you from the dead, you will be like him. This is the glorious future that God has promised to you, the children of God. Yeah, your purification. This future that I've described to you, I want you to think of it as a large mass of water that God is holding back with a plastic sheet. Got me? Your future glory, your future sinlessness, your future deathlessness, your future sicklessness, that future, think of it as this massive, big ball of water that God is holding back with a large plastic sheet. Now, first question, why would God hold back such a glorious future from you? Here's why. In order to give you the glorious future of the children of God, Jesus must turn, return to judge the living and the dead. God knows that when Jesus judges the living and the dead, some people are going into the lake of fire because they are not his children. God does not want those people to go into the lake of fire, so he holds back the future to give them an opportunity to repent. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And 2 Peter chapter 3 says he is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness, but he is patient with you, desiring all people to repent. So he holds back your future as the children of God so that other people who are not currently his children may repent and return to him and then he will give them that glorious future also. That's why he's holding back. Now, I told you he's holding back with plastic. Why plastic? God can hold it back with concrete. God can hold it back with steel. God can hold it back with transparent aluminum for you Star Trek fans. Instead, God's holding it back with plastic. And here's why he holds it back with plastic. It leaks. It leaks. There are holes in the plastic. And the future that God is holding back leaks into your present. You understand what I'm saying? So that God, right now, gives you tastes of the future that is yours. He gives you appetizers of the future that is coming. Right now, God is introducing into your life a little taste of the sicklessness, a little taste of the deathlessness, a little taste of the sinlessness that will be fully manifest in you when Jesus returns. <coughs> when you rise from the dead, you see God. You see His bare naked glory. You stand in His presence. For land's sakes, people, you are going to see Jesus. But when you stand and kneel in the presence of the sacrament of the altar 
and you eat his body and drink his blood, you're in the presence of Jesus already. The sacrament of the altar is one of those ways that God permits the future glory that will be yours to leak into the present. In the future, you will stand and behold the full radiant glory of Jesus. Right now, you stand in the presence of Jesus under the forms of bread and wine. And you are just as much in his presence now as you will be then. But your comprehension of it, your apprehension of it, will be so much more glorious then than it is now. And so Jesus gives you that little foretaste. You ever gotten sick and gotten better? You catch cold, you get over it, right? You get the flu, you get one of those shots, you get better. You get some stomach bug, you go to the doctor, she prescribes something, you get better. I love nausea medication, best thing, best thing. Okay? You get cancer, you get the chemotherapy and the radiation treatments and the the surgery, and you get better. When God does that, He is giving you a little piece of your future sicklessness in advance so that you get to experience at least a little bit of it now. He doesn't withhold all of your future from you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get that? Which means that those people who labor in the medical professions are those people who have the privilege of bringing the glorious future of God to us in advance. That's what medical professionals do. They bring that leak in the plastic to us in advance. You ever had an accident? You should have died in. You walked away. You ever driven through an intersection that somebody else died in and you lived? Ever had a terminal disease and it was either cured by the doctors or cured in some miraculous fashion that they couldn't explain? See, that is God rescuing you from death. That is God giving you a foretaste of your future deathlessness. For after you rise from the dead, it will always be that way. You'll never die. But here in the present, he gives you a little foretaste, a little experience of your deathlessness in advance so that you know what's coming, or at least a piece of it. And folks, your sinlessness, your sinlessness, God is holding back the full experience of your sinlessness, but some of that sinlessness is leaking into your present. And that's what 1 John chapter 3 means by, all the children of God purify themselves as He is pure. If the future that I have just described to you is not your future, then you are not the children of God. But since you are the children of God, this future is your future. And so there is a sinlessness that is coming to you, and God permits that sinlessness to leak into your present. Every time you are generous, every time you're kind, every time you save somebody else, 